hour worship service at the First Unitarian Society of Ithaca. Here we gather, nurturing our connections, seeking inspiration, and embracing the changing season. My name is Suranki, and I'm the Celebration Associate today. Thank you so much for joining us. Whether you're a first-time viewer or have been joining us on this year-long journey of virtual church, we are so glad you're here with us. Please check our website for more information about how to create connections. If you'd like to receive updates describing opportunities for engagement, please email a request to office at uuithaca.org. Newcomers are especially invited to visit our website and complete a newcomer form on the homepage. We have a special announcement that this afternoon all ages are welcome to the Tutelo Park Nature Walk and Parents Group from 12.30 to 1.30. Our service this morning is being live streamed from our beautiful sanctuary in downtown Ithaca and will be available for later viewing as well on our YouTube channel. We look forward to seeing you at the live coffee hour that follows the service. We light this chalice for the warmth of love, the light of truth, and the energy of action. Beneath all curious customs and beliefs, deeper than ecclesiastical creeds, more vital and basic than priestly rites, stands one impressive fact. Man and woman touch infinity. Our home is in immensity. We live, move, and have our being in an eternity. This magnificent assertion is our greatest affirmation. We invite you now to please join us in singing hymn number 20, Be Thou My Vision. Good morning, friends. Tomorrow is Indigenous Peoples Day, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge that our church is located on land that is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee people, and specifically the Cayuga Nation, or the Gayakono. Their presence is imbued in these lakes, valleys, gorges, and hills. May we nurture our relationship with our Haudenosaunee neighbors and our shared responsibilities to this place of their homelands where we mutually reside. 
I have our Wonder Box with me again today, so let's take a look and see what's inside. Here is a bell or a chime. We listen to it, it rings clearly. Did you hear how long the sound of the bell lasted? Was it hard for you to silently listen until the ringing was all done? Sometimes that's how it is when we're listening to others. They are telling us something important, but we often don't stay quiet long enough to hear their entire thought, or we interrupt them before they are done speaking. How does that feel to you when others don't listen fully and let you finish? Not so good, huh? It makes us feel bad and can hurt our relationship with that person. This is a reminder about how important listening is to build and cultivate relationships. Remember, this month we are exploring the theme of cultivating relationships. And listening carefully and fully is one of the best skills we can use to do that. It helps us really understand our friends and what's important to them. It makes them feel like we care. And often it is a way of showing them how interesting and special they are. So today we're going to explore the ways in which listening helps us build and strengthen relationships. We're going to become better listening experts. Today we have a story that is a great way to explore how listening builds relationships. It's a story about a group of people who use special sounds to listen to and help people heal. These people are indigenous women who are jingle dancers. They are using this special tradition of theirs now, today, to help the world heal the fear caused by the pandemic. This story also shows how important it is not just to ask people to help you, but also to listen carefully when they can't give you exactly what you're asking for. This is Jingle Dancer by Cynthia Ledich Smith. Tink, 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 sang cone-shaped jingles sewn to Grandma Wolf's dress. Every Grandma bounce step brought clattering tinks as light blurred silver against jingles of tin. Jenna daydreamed at the kitchen table, tasting honey on fry bread, her heart beating to the brum 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 of the powwow drum. As Moon kissed Sun goodnight, Jenna shifted her head on Grandma Wolf's shoulder. I want to jingle dance too. Next powwow, you could dance girls, Grandma Wolf answered, but we don't have enough time to mail order tins for rolling jingles. Again and again, Jenna watched a video of Grandma Wolf jingle dancing. When Grandma bounce stepped on TV, Jenna bounce stepped on family room carpet. But Jenna's dress would not be able to sing. It needed four rows of jingles. As sun fetched morning, Jenna danced east to great, great Aunt Sis's porch. Jenna's bounce steps crunched autumn leaves, but her steps didn't jingle. Once again, Great Aunt Sis told Jenna a Muskegee Creek story about Bat. Although other animals had said he was too small to make a difference, Bat won a ball game by flying high and catching a ball in his teeth. Rising sunlight reached through a window pane and flashed against, what was it, hanging in Aunt Sis's bedroom? Jingles, on a dress too long quiet. May I borrow enough jingles to make a row, Jenna asked not wanting to take so many that Aunt Sis's dress would lose its voice. You may, Aunt Sis answered, rubbing her calves. My legs don't work so good anymore. Will you dance for me? I will, said Jenna, with a kiss on Aunt Sis's cheek. Now Jenna's dress needed three more rows. 
As Sun arrived at mid-circle, Jenna skipped south to Mrs. Scott's brand new duplex. At Jenna's side, jingles clinked. Mrs. Scott led Jenna into the kitchen. Once again, Jenna rolled dough and Mrs. Scott fried it. May I borrow enough jingles to make a row? Jenna asked, not wanting to take so many that Mrs. Scott's dress would lose its voice. You may, Mrs. Scott answered, tossing flour with her apron. At powwow, I'll be busy selling fry bread and Indian tacos. Will you dance for me? I will, said Jenna with a high five. Now Jenna's dress needed two more rows. As Sun caught a glimpse of Moon, Jenna strolled west to Cousin Elizabeth's apartment. At Jenna's side, jingles clanked. Elizabeth had arrived home late from the law firm. Once again, Jenna helped Elizabeth carry in her files. May I borrow enough jingles to make a row? Jenna asked, not wanting to take so many that Elizabeth's dress would lose its voice. You may, Elizabeth answered, burrowing through her messy closet for her jingle dress. This weekend, I'm working on a big case and can't go to powwow. Will you dance for me? I will, said Jenna, clasping her cousin's hands. Now Jenna's dance needed one more row of jingles, but she didn't know which way to turn. As moon glowed pale, Jenna shuffled north to Grandma Wolf's. At Jenna's side, jingles sat silent. High above, clouds wavered like worried ghosts. When Jenna tugged open the door, Jingle sang, tink, 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 tink. Grandma Wolf was jingle dancing on TV. Jenna breathed in every hey ah ho oh of a powwow song. Her heart beat, brum, 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 to the pounding of the drum. On a family room carpet, beaded moccasins waited for Jenna's feet. She shucked off a sneaker and slipped on a moccasin that long before had danced with Grandma Wolf. Jenna knew where to find her fourth row. May I borrow enough jingles to make a row? Jenna asked, not wanting to take so many that Grandma Wolf's dress would lose its voice. You may, Grandma said with a hug. Now Jenna's dress could sing. Every night that week, Jenna helped Grandma Wolf sew on jingles and bring together the dance regalia. Every night, Jenna practiced her bounce steps. Brum, 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 sounded the drum at the powwow the next weekend. As light blurred silver, Jenna jingles danced. Her great aunt Sis, whose legs ached. For Mrs. Scott, who sold fry bread. For Elizabeth, who worked on her big case, and for Grandma Wolf, who warmed like the sun. Tink, 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 tink. What was your favorite part of the story? I liked how thoughtful Jenna was, never wanting to ask for so many jingles that the other wouldn't still have enough. In the book, Jenna respectfully and clearly communicated her need to her four female relatives for the tins to make the jingles. They, in turn, communicated clearly their own needs, hopes, and wants. Can it be scary sometimes to ask others for something that you need? Sometimes it can be. But listening, truly listening, is a skill that I'm still working on and something that we all work on for our entire lives. And listening to the voices of indigenous peoples and taking the time to really hear their wisdom and their needs is so important. So on every day of the year, let's all try to remember that listening is one way we can cultivate relationships and continue to live into our values and principles as Unitarian Universalists. I hope to see you this afternoon at the park. I invite us now to enter into the spirit of meditation and prayer. 
Today in this congregation, someone is hurting or in sorrow. Today in this congregation, someone is anxious because of events in the world. Today in this congregation, someone is filled with joy and wants to celebrate. Today in this congregation, someone is lonely. And still we affirm in the message of the words of Clarence Russell Skinner about how we live in spite of all beliefs, what is basic, that we live, move, and being, have our being together. Let us reflect. Man and woman touch infinity. We are creatures on this planet we reach above and beyond what we know. We invent devices that enable us to see far beyond our physical reach and imagine even more. Our home is an immensity. We are small, but we live in a reality so large that it challenges us to be larger than we are. We live, move, and have our being in an eternity. Each of us living the full span of our lives, how many few, how many years, how many few years that may be, long or short, we live fully the span of our lives. Amen. Blessed be. Our meditation hymn today will be found in the Teal Hymnal, number 1069, Ancient Mother. Each week, we take an offering to sustain the important ministries and programs of this congregation and its presence in Ithaca. The giving information will appear on your screen in a moment during the offertory music. Giving to the plate is important. It's a symbol of our gratitude for this service and our ongoing commitment to support the work of this church. So please take a moment and give either through the text option or the giving button on the home page of the website.
these gifts bring about connection, inspiration, and engagement within these walls and beyond. This poem is titled An American Sunrise by Joy Harjo. We were running out of breath as we ran out to meet ourselves. We were surfacing the edge of our ancestors' fight and ready to strike. It was difficult to lose days in the Indian bar if you were straight, easy if you played pool and drank to remember to forget. We made plans to be professional, and did. And some of us could sing when we drove to the edge of the mountain with a drum. We made sense of our beautiful, crazed lives under the starry sky. Sin was invented by the Christians, as was the devil, we sang. We were the heathens, but it needed to be saved from them thin chance. We knew we were all related in this story. A little gin will clarify the dark and make us all feel like dancing. We had something to do with the origins of blues and jazz. I argued with the music as I filled the jukebox with dimes in June. Forty years later, and we still want justice. We are still America. We. Well, during every church year, I do at least one sermon and service based on poetry. Now throughout the year I use a lot of poetry as readings and illustrations, but sometimes the poetry is itself at the center, and this is the case today. Now Joy Harjo is a great poet. She has been writing poetry since she was a student at the University of New Mexico, and has been widely published for well over 40 years. She's also the author of prose works and of two children's books. She explores issues of personal growth, the history and rights of indigenous people, the issues facing girls and women, the oppression of all ethnic minorities. She is a mother and a grandmother. Her indigenous mother and father, her white stepfather, her siblings, her children and grandchildren, her friends and her lovers, her ancestors are all in the mix of her writing. So also in the mix is the history of the Muscogee Creek people, of whom she is one. Now there is a poem that combines personal, political, and historical meanings. Her poem, We Were Running Out of Breath. That's the opening words, but the title is Crazy Bear. And in her poem, she is open about struggling with night-crawling creatures that populated many dreams and with debilitating panic. She is equally open about the combination of spirit, thought, visions, and dreams through which she came to control these demons, if not entirely vanquish them. This passage I'm about to read combines the personal, the political, and the historical. And it's just four short lines. I grow tired of the heartache of every small and large war passed from generation to generation. 
Some of the wars she speaks of involved her alcoholic father, whom she loved, but who cheated on her mother so many times that her parents divorced. Some were the stepfather, but with the stepfather who abused her mother and his stepchildren, seeking to expel from the home first Joy the oldest and then the younger siblings. Generations earlier, there had been the displacement of her ancestors, first from Georgia to Alabama and then on the tier, uh, Trail of Tears to Oklahoma between 1834 and 1837. And the continued disenfranchisement of indigenous people and since the 1960s, a civil rights movement of indigenous people, people we also sometimes call Native Americans. Her poems are in many places, many collections, and she wrote a poem called The Fight, which I won't quote at length today, but it's just one of many that mix up these experiences, this history, these changes, these parts of life. So why am I talking about an indigenous or Native American poet on the Sunday of the weekend many people know as Columbus Day. Well, you heard, already heard that we also mark Indigenous Peoples Day. The discussion about replacing Columbus Day began in 1977 at the UN-sponsored International Conference on Discrimination Against Indigenous Populations in the Americas. The idea spread with the celebration in 1992 of the 500th anniversary of Columbus's landing in 1492. People began to see the Columbus holiday as a validation of the European colonization of the Americas through the displacement of indigenous peoples and even through violence that rose to the level of genocide. But why Joy Harjo in particular? Well, my interest in her began two years ago in 2019 when she was appointed Poet Laureate of the United States, typically a one-term appointment, first bestowed in 1936 on Joseph Auslander, and since then on many men and a few women, but all outstanding poets, if not all well known to the general public. She is the first indigenous person to receive this honor. Her childhood and youth was difficult. She was one of four children who had sufficient means to own a home in Tulsa, but her father's drinking and philandering shattered the family. Her mother's second marriage to a domineering and violent white man who forbade singing and listening to music in the house was also dampening to the spirit, depriving Joy and her mother of listening to music, a pleasure they shared, and singing together, a talent they shared. Before the stepfather came on the scene, Joy acted in school plays, drew an art class, and on her own. She was able to keep drawing, and then her stepfather declared she'd be sent to an evangelical Christian boarding school for high school. She writes of how she thought about running away from home. I quote, I could feel the bright sun of knowing way in the distance, as if it were rising over the mountain of my distress. The sun gave me another way to consider God. The God I knew radiated such light. I could not accept an image of God as an angry white man who looked like my stepfather or the preacher. The knowing told me there was another way. The knowing always spoke softly and wisely. She and her mother came to know about the Institute of American Indian Arts, a boarding school in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The school became her vehicle for education within the indigenous cultures. The school had students from many nations, as well as being the locus for developing solidarity among the different indigenous nations. Now, she and her, many of her friends, of course, skirted the school rules, which involved not drinking, but yes, they did. It involved not dating, but she had a boyfriend who was an older post-high school student and a member of the Cherokee Nation. She became pregnant by him, 
She left school to become a teenage mother and bride. Several years later, still married, she entered the University of New Mexico and received a bachelor's degree at the age of 24. But by the time of her graduation, she was divorced and involved with an older male poet by whom she had a second child. Her partner while in college was 10 years older, a member of the Pueblo Nation and a poet. In his poem, she wrote, were his Pueblo and his people, our love and the love for justice. The English language was proud to occupy new forms." Unquote. But her partner had both her father's drinking habits and her stepfather's violence. By the time she graduated from the University of New Mexico, she was writing poetry, although in college she had focused on visual arts. In 1975, she published a chapbook of poems and that's when she enrolled in the Master of Fine Arts program at the University of Iowa. On her own, a single mom with two children. Since then, she has produced a significant body of written and recorded work and taught at many universities. And at age 40, she took up the saxophone, an instrument played by her grandmother, Naomi Harjo. She now plays saxophone professionally, as well as being a poet. She wrote a poem titled, When Rabbit Invented the Saxophone. She places the image of rabbit, often a trickster, with the mixing of cultures and the birth of jazz. She writes, when one of the last trails of tears wound through New Orleans, rabbit, the rabbit trickster, decided he wanted to be a musician. He was tired of walking and they had all the fun. So many tribes were jamming there, African, native, and a few remnant French, making a new music of melody, love, and beat. Rabbit climbed up to the stage but had nothing to offer. Just his strut, charming banter, and what looked like a long stick down the tight leg of his pants. Rabbit turned his back to the band, like that genius Miles Davis, pulled out his stick. He made a horn with his hands. The stick is so special, bragged Rabbit, as he turned his back to the jam. No one else has one like this. You've never heard it before. It's called a sax o o phone. This poem is an example of how, Har how Harjo combines Muskegee, Muskogee culture with disciplined English that can occupy new forms and new thoughts. She connects indigenous cultures with the cultures of the people brought to America as slaves. She lives not in the evangelical ch Christianity of her teenage church, but in the spirituality of the Muskogee Creek. Elsewhere, she writes of spirits in dreams and those who die and go to the Milky Way. She is convinced that the Creek or Muscogee people, through their interaction with slaves and former slaves, took part in the creation of jazz. She admires the music of the late jazz saxophonist Jim Pepper, child of Muscogee mother and caw father, who built jazz improvisations based on native chants he had learned as a child. She writes of him, I heard about Jim Pepper long before I finally met him in Brooklyn. He was quite a legend and appeared as a bear whose laughing could be heard all the way across his land. When he died, I know he had gone to the Milky Way and left us with a gift of music. But I would pr promise I would get back to Harjo's poetry. Her poem, American Sunrise, starts with the experience of young indigenous people when Harjo is a young indigenous person herself, a student knowing that whether Muscogee, Caw, Cherokee, or of any nation, there was solidarity to be had among Native Americans. In 1994, she wrote, the Indian wars never ended in this country. We could date them as beginning with Columbus. Of course, we fought intertribally amongst ourselves, but a religious fervor large enough to nearly destroy a continent 
was imported across the Atlantic. We were hated for our difference by others. She goes on, the civil rights movement awakened many of us to the beauty in our difference. We began to understand how oppression had become our eyes, our ears, our tongues. We rose up together and continued to sing as we always had, but with more pride, a greater love for ourselves. More recently, she wrote that she and her fellow students, now of course they are all much older, middle-aged and older, but that are still running, they are still running, and still lighting up a new sunrise. And further, she says, the indigenous peoples who are making their way up from the southern hemisphere are a continuation of the trail of tears. So the words of one more of her poems would be a fitting conclusion to this sermon. All night we dance the weave of joys and tears. All night we're lit with the sunrise of forever. Just ahead of us, through the trees, one generation after another. We invite you now to join us in our closing hymn, number 40, The Morning Hangs a Signal. Now whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble and of good worth, let us carry our company and our words with us. Let us go forth to our living, to live fully, to live righteously, to make the world more fair and peaceful, to make life more real 
for us and all our fellow human beings. Amen. Blessed be. Thank you.